Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Red Telecom video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to start things out with AMD's Navi range of graphics cards, which are the eagerly anticipated successor to the current Polaris range of cards from the company. So, a couple of weeks ago, I put out an exclusive that AMD were planning to launch the cards in July, but with an announcement in June. However, this no longer seems to be the case. Despite, after my information uh, coming to light, various other websites were reporting that according to uh, their sources, June did sound like the correct time for the unveiling, and the launch of July also sounding about right, there is actually an update to the story. Uh, a couple of my sources have whispered that this is most likely going to be the case, and another website Cal Cutland are also reporting from their sources that we will actually see Navi being be delayed until October. But the good news is we should still see some type of announcement surrounding Navi in June. So what's going on here? Well, there is still a little bit of confusion exactly why, but it's most likely down to production numbers with the 7NM process. Essentially, what AMD are doing, of course, is tasking 7NM production for all of their different products, and other companies, of course, are also using TSMC for their different products. So what the issue is, is basically AMD don't necessarily know if they're going to have the numbers available of cards for the July target. So instead, they are most likely going to be delaying launch. And so the latest date supposedly we'll see launch of Navi is going to be October. Obviously, in AMD's best interests, the launch would be sooner, but most likely uh, Navi is going to launch in around October. So we don't have any updates in regarding the specifications, unfortunately, or performance. Uh, it would appear that what we heard previously is going to be most likely accurate. AMD are going to be aiming to release a competitor to the mid-range of NVIDIA's current Turing products, so most likely around the RTX 2070 at the top end. Pricing is probably going to be around the 300 US dollars, but next year will be a larger, more powerful variant of Navi, which you can probably guess is going to be focused more on the higher end SKUs of NVIDIA, so most likely that say the RTX 2080, possibly the RTX 2080 Ti. This all makes sense given what we know about the Radeon 7s, and I'm going to get more into the Radeon 7 stuff in a moment. But too long, didn't read. The good news is we're still going to get Navi this year. The bad news is there is going to be that delay, which is definitely unfortunate. It means that if you are not one of the few people who managed to snag a Radeon 7 graphics card, or you don't want to spend Radeon 7, Radeon 7 excuse me, level of pricing, on a graphics card, then you're going to have to wait if you do want an AMD product. It also means that NVIDIA, at least in the short term, have a reprieve, because what essentially we have, of course, is NVIDIA launching the 1600 series of cards, which are based on the Turing architecture, albeit without RTX technology, and also the RTX 2060, which at least in the short term anyway, will not have a direct competitor from AMD. If I had to guess, and this is not based on industry whispers, AMD will continue their strategy that they have been for the last couple of months. Essentially, cut the price off their cards as much as humanly possible. Do the whole bundle thing, which, to be fair, is pretty compelling. I mean, you can get Resident Evil 2 and Devil May Cry and other games uh, bundled in with the AMD graphics card. Uh, and we've also, also seen some significant cuts for Vega, so if AMD can continue to do that to at least keep some mind share with gamers, which, at least in my opinion, was one of the primary reasons they released Rally on 7, that will help tide them over until we see the launch of Navi. And Navi, from what we do understand from various leaks now, Navi is going to be seen in not just the PlayStation 5, but also the next generation of Xbox. So it's also possible that some of the reasons that we're seeing a delay here is because of that as well, but who really knows exactly? Either way, it's disappointing for gamers, but with any luck at all, one of the 
better things that we can get from this is that the drivers may be slightly more mature. As we all know, there have been some teething problems with Radeon 7 when it comes to drivers. Uh, so without any luck, AMD will have a little bit more time to optimize the performance of the cards because obviously one of the things is when AMD or any uh, graphics card vendors or actually motherboard vendors or anyone actually sends any product to reviewers, first impressions really do count. Like that first rave of reviews is what everyone has in their mind. So even if you increase performance, let's say 10 or 20%, three months after launch, everyone just has in their brain the initial performance numbers. And that's very important for AMD to get that right. So while I am disappointed that Navi is not going to launch in July, at least according to these latest rumors, um, perhaps it's a good thing if they can actually put that time into the software and optimize the drivers the best they can, and also work on any other little bugs as well. So while the GPU side of things from AMD is somewhat disappointing in with the delay and all, the CPU side of things is actually pretty darn good because according to Mercury Research, which also ties in with AMD's own numbers, AMD's market share for CPUs is the highest since 2013. And this goes across not only the desktop section of the market, but also um, the portable slash laptop section, along with servers as well. And it doesn't really surprise me, to be honest. When you think about it, AMD have managed to execute very well over the past couple of generations of Ryzen processor. Since the initial launch of Zen, AMD have been extremely aggressive with its product catalog. For example, when, let's say, the 1700 launched back in the day, the Ryzen 7 1700, at the price it did launch, it basically scuppered half of Intel's HEDT offerings because not only was the performance relatively comparable, but it did so at a fraction of the cost. This is even more true if you take into consideration the platform cost, in other words, the motherboard, along with the memory uh, required as well, because obviously it only required dual channel memory rather than quad channel memory. So let's actually have a look at the market share analysis here. Starting things out with servers, which AMD were using, of course, Optron to compete with various uh, Intel Xeon processors, and towards the latter part of the Optron's life, it wasn't really doing so too successfully because obviously Optron was getting rather long in the tooth, and that's putting it, well, very generously, actually. But if we were to look at servers back in uh, the fourth quarter of 2017, AMD had about 0.8% unit share. However, by the third quarter of 2018, that had risen to 1.6%, and now it's at 3.2% unit share. That's a 1.5% uh, increase in share uh, quarter to quarter versus a 2.4% sorry, a 2.4 share point increase year on year, which is absolutely insane. Now, moving on to the desktop side of things, fortunately, the bulldozer slash excavator architecture did have some fans. AMD were able to, of course, sell some processors. In fact, we reviewed the FX8350 from the company back in the day, and I said myself that while it certainly isn't as good as Intel's offerings in single-thread performance, for the price that AMD were charging, especially when you factor in, once again, the platform cost, in other words, the mobile boards, it did have some good uh, usage cases. But nevertheless, AMD have made some rather large strides when it comes to the desktop. So it was 12% back in the fourth quarter of 2017, and now in the fourth quarter of 2018, we're at 15.8% unit share. So that's quite significant. And that's in the face of pretty stiff competition from Intel. We saw, of course, the eighth and now ninth generation launches from the company, which are pretty darn impressive processors. And finally, uh, the notebook section, we have 6.9% back in the fourth quarter of 2017, and now it's at 12.1%. So once again, uh, we see a 5.3% share point increase over a year over year. You might recall that last year, Brian Kranich in one of his final official interviews for Intel uh, stated that the company, that is Intel, were on a mission to ensure that AMD did not capture a significant portion of the server market. In fact, Intel's nightmares were essentially that AMD would capture 15 to 20% of the server 
market and uh, Intel's job right now was to ensure that uh, AMD were not to do that. And it's quite interesting because given what we know about the roadmap from AMD and from Intel, there is going to be that lull between the launch of the next generation of processors from Intel and of course the launch of AMD's Zen 2 based products. And even if all of the rumors, let's say for the Ryzen 3000 series, aren't accurate, let's say that they're not as good as what we've predicted and what the leaks have been. Let's even say that AMD decided to sandbag and say, well, okay, we're going to just launch a 12 core part. We're going to hold back the 16 core variants and just wait to see what Intel do. The fact of the matter is that AMD still have a significant core count and most likely architectural advantage over uh, Intel. So in the short term, at least, AMD are definitely going to be able to pile on a heck of a lot of pressure on Intel. So it's going to be very interesting to see what these figures are like in, let's say, two or three quarters time by the end of this year to see what type of gains uh, AMD have made and see how uh, Intel can actually compete in terms of the mindshare of consumers. I'll also be interested to see if Intel decide to become more aggressive when it comes to the pricing model. Obviously, if we were to look at, let's say, the pricing of the i9 9900K or even the i7 9700K, they are pretty expensive. And you can make arguments all day long of whether it's worth the cash to you over, let's say, a 2700X. But I don't think many people can argue in the favor of the i9-9900K versus a 12-core Ryzen part or even an 8-core Ryzen part based on the Zen 2 architecture, particularly if AMD can nail the single-core performance, which is going to be one of the keys. I did say in a recent video that according to some of my sources, one of the key components right now to AMD success, at least according to their partners, is for them to hit a high performance with one to two threads being active. In other words, to really push gaming performance, because as we all know, games such as CSGO and whatever else, they really do require, they really do push high uh, clock speeds on the CPU, but also really rely on single core performance. Whether AMD can achieve that or not, or whether they're going to continue their multi-thread success, who knows? After all, all we really have is a couple of Cine bench runs and other benchmarks which have leaked regarding the Ryzen 3000. And we've seen, of course, uh, the user benchmark results where we saw a 12 core part. So right now there's a lot of stuff, uh, stuff up in the air when it comes to Ryzen 3000, along with all of the next generation of CPUs from the company. But I do suspect, suspect that Intel are definitely gonna be facing a lot more pressure over the next couple of months. And now moving over to NVIDIA and ray tracing. This is a smaller piece of news, but I do feel it's worth covering. NVIDIA, of course, have invested significant amounts of resources in ray tracing, not just in the Turing architecture, but also the software side of things and pushing developers to adopt the technology. And it's worth noting, of course, that Intel themselves believe that ray tracing is going to be instrumental in future games. We have AMD, who almost certainly will be embracing ray tracing as well, from what we've learned. Even the next generation of Xbox is rumored to be using some form of ray tracing, or at least capable of supporting it. But in here and now, NVIDIA are the ones who are trying to pioneer. The problem is, of course, by being the first, they are also the ones who are trying to convince well, us, in other words, the end users, that ray tracing right now is worth it. There is a lot of debate, of course, that Turing was just trying to accomplish ray tracing a bit too early, and maybe NVIDIA should have waited a little longer for the industry as a whole to be ready to adopt this. So what we have, of course, is rather expensive generation of GPUs, and when it comes to standard rasterization performance, yes, without question, the 2080, the 2080 Ti, I'm not gonna list the entire product stack, but they are faster than, let's say, the 1080 and the 1080 Ti and so on, but whether it's worth it to you or not, if you have, let's say, a GTX 1080 or a 1080 Ti, you may not be that tempted to upgrade. After all, the 1080 Ti is roughly on par with a 2080, give or take, depending on the generation, but, 
Nvidia are of course looking to change that and one of the ways they can do that is by getting developers on side. It's not just that you have to implement ray tracing in a game, you also need to ensure that ray tracing is implemented in a way which has the minimal performance impact in a title. To Nvidia's credit we have seen some significant performance upticks with let's say, oh I don't know, uh, Battlefield 5, but there has also been some significant delays. I was one of those people who bought Shadow of the Tomb Raider and I'm still waiting for the patch. And the murmur is, whether you believe it or not, that the studio have just had a significant amount of difficulty in implementing the ray tracing technology. Although to be fair, Shadow of the Tomb Raider also had a number of bugs which I myself had to kind of deal with. Regardless, NVIDIA are doing their best to educate developers, and they are doing so by putting out a free series of PDFs, which you will be able to actually buy this in hardback form in March, which will allegedly really help developers to uh, get the most out of ray tracing technology. NVIDIA have commissioned over 60 experts in the field of ray tracing to collaborate and put these uh, PDFs slash book together. Now, just to clarify, this is not a book that is going to teach you, okay, what is ray tracing? This is how you do the very basics of ray tracing. It's not for that. Instead, NVIDIA here are trying to focus on techniques which are perhaps lesser known or just optimization to ensure that developers are getting the best performance possible. It's going to be interesting looking back at Turing in three, four, five years with hindsight and saying whether or not NVIDIA were too early pushing uh, ray tracing technology. Either way, it's great that the company are putting this uh, documentation of out to the wild, but once again, whether it's too early or not for ray tracing with Turing remains to be seen. Anyway, with all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. Normal stuff if you did, like, share, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.